Good evening. Welcome to our Wednesday night Bible study and prayer time here at Cornerstone. Uh, we are uh, delighted to have you join us. Uh, and uh, tonight we're continuing in our series, Heaven and Hell. Last Wednesday night, we started talking about the perfections of heaven. And tonight, we want to uh, finish that particular emphasis on heaven. Last week, if you'll remember, we talked about the perfect beauty of heaven. We talked about the perfect worship uh, that will take place in heaven. And we talked about the perfect life that we will experience. Tonight, uh, we're going to be looking uh, in this, in chapter 22, those three we found in Revelation chapter 21. Tonight, we're going to be looking in Revelation chapter 22, and we're going to look at two more perfections in heaven, and that is the perfection of knowledge and then the perfection of service. So get your Bibles ready, and in just a moment, we're going to continue looking at God's Word and what it says to us about this wonderful place called heaven. Join me with me as we begin, though, in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you tonight that we can continue to look into your Word. Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit would speak through me, and Lord, that you would anoint the message, and I pray you would anoint the ears of the people that are tuned in tonight. I pray, God, that you would help us to get a better grasp, a better understanding of this wonderful place called heaven, your home, the place that Jesus went back to to prepare a place for us and a place that we look forward to spending eternity with you and all the redeemed of God, um, as we've already talked about uh, one day when we depart this world and we enter into the glory of heaven. We love you, Lord, and we praise you. We thank you so much for the ways in which you continue to bless our lives, and we pray that you will speak to us now, for we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, take your Bibles and open them to, if you haven't already, to Revelation chapter 22 and the uh, fifth uh, perfect or the fourth perfection about heaven is the perfect knowledge that we will have in heaven. Friend, heaven will be marked by perfect knowledge of God. John writes, look there in Revelation 22, verse 4. Look what it says. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. You know, Paul described this knowledge in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 12. Paul wrote... For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. He said, now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. You see, in heaven, there will be nothing that we cannot discover with our minds. The secrets of God will be unveiled. We will know as we are known. The Bible says that God knows us perfectly. God knows us completely. And in heaven, we will know God in the same way. We will know what everything that we need to know in heaven. The secrets of God will be unveiled. There will never be an end to our learning in heaven. There will be nothing to block our knowledge. There will be no need to worry about feeling dumb in heaven or ignorant or not knowing the answers. Our knowledge will be perfect because we will see God face to face and we will have the mind of Christ. And with the mind of Christ, we will know fully. Not halfway, not partially, not uh, a little bit, not even almost everything, but we will know fully. You see, while we're here on earth, we only sort of know or 
partially understand, but in heaven, we will know completely. No need to worry about feeling like the, uh, you know, the, 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 maybe the, the person uh, at the bottom of the class or the middle of the class. Um, we will all be at the top of the class when it comes to heaven. We will know all the answers. Our present knowledge will increase beyond belief. When I was young and I needed to write a paper for school, I had to go to, now some of you are going to laugh, I had to go to the World Book Encyclopedia. Um, uh, some of you don't even know what an encyclopedia is because they, I, as far as I know, they don't make them anymore. Uh, maybe they have them online, but there were books and there was a set of them. I forget how many there were, but at least 20 uh, sets of uh, the encyclopedia. Encyclopedia. Uh, today, now you just turn on a computer and go to the internet, and a world of knowledge is opened up to you. Literally, everything you want to know or need to know is at your fingertips. Friend, that's absolutely amazing when you think about it. When you can go online at any time, anywhere. I know that, for instance, when uh, Nancy and I may be watching a TV program or something, especially uh, a program on the history station, uh, when we're looking at something historical, and we will immediately, there'll be somebody, a king, or uh, some period in history that's being discussed, and we'll immediately go, to Google on our phone and read about that particular person or that particular time in history. But here's what I want you to think about. If mankind can do that, if we've progressed that far to where we have literally just about anything we need to know at our fingertips, friend, think what heaven is going to be like. Think what heaven's going to be like in terms of access to information and all the data that we receive in heaven. Listen, there won't be any question as to whether to believe the information you get or not like we have to do now. Even just because something is on the internet, just because you find something on Google or Wikipedia, that doesn't necessarily mean it's historically true or that it's uh, accurate in its truthfulness. But when we get to heaven... Everything will be perfectly true and right. Perfect knowledge will be one of the fringe benefits, not essential for our eternal happiness, of course, but at the same time, it'll be nice to have. Think about this. We will finally know the whole story of God's redemptive plan from the, uh, for the world, from the creation of mankind, all the way back to Adam and Eve, to the day of the Lord. We will know everything about God's redemptive plan. We will know how old creation is. You know, people argue whether the young earth theory or the old earth theory. Guess what? We will know when we get to heaven. We will know exactly how old creation is. We will know how many stars are in the universe. We will know how the world became populated with so many different people groups and languages. We will know what Abraham must have, have you ever wondered what Abraham must have thought when he was chosen by God to be the father of his people? What must have gone through Abraham's mind? We will know how Noah with just his three sons and their wives built that great big ark. I've often wondered how could just though that small number of people build that humongous boat. We will know how Moses parted the Red Sea. We will know how Jonah managed to survive in the belly of a great big fish for three days. We will know what happened in those 400 years between the end of the Old Testament 
and the beginning of the New Testament. We will know what happened in Jesus' life. Have you ever wondered why we don't have any more information about Jesus beyond the age of 12 up until uh, age 30 when he started his ministry? We will know what Jesus went through, what, uh, how he developed and grew and what he faced and those kinds of things. We'll know those kinds of things when we get to heaven. We'll understand the doctrines of election and predestination that so many people are confused about or question and many get into theological uh, arguments over. We will know the events of the tribulation all of that we will know and much, much more. Beyond that, I think about the parents of my college friend, Jim Ricecamp. Jim's parents will finally know and understand why God took their 19-year-old son through an unexplainable and sudden death after he had been practicing baseball one evening when we were students at Campbell University and Jim collapsed on the practice field there uh, at Campbell and died on the way to the hospital. And no one, they took autopsy reports, no one could figure out why he died. We will understand why my Christian mom will see um, how she, my mom herself will see how her mental sickness helped her pastor's son to be a more compassionate and understanding of people who have faced the similar illness that she faced. We will lift our hands and glorify God when we see how God used our sacrificial gifts to help those um, uh, who were benefited through our gifts to the Lottie Moon Christmas offering or the Annie Armstrong offering to advance his kingdom. Our friend Eula Mae Cummings will see the hundreds of children who were blessed by her generous gifts to Samaritan's Purse each year at Christmas. We'll see how many times God engineered the right places and the right moments so that we'd meet just the right people. Like a young man from North Carolina going to the Grand Canyon to do mission work and meeting a young girl, a young lady from Dallas, Texas, and the two met there in the Grand Canyon, coming from two different states, fell in love, and have spent the rest of their lives together, raising two children, and now um, two grandsons and another grandchild on the way. We will understand how all of that worked together for God's glory and for our good. We'll understand all those things that troubled us here and why bad things happened to good people. Friend, we will understand when we get to heaven how everything fit. We will understand how everything in our life counted. Nothing was wasted. Every jot Every tittle of life will give supreme glory to our all-wise and all-powerful God. We will know fully as we have been known. I don't know about you, but I'm looking forward to getting to heaven so I will no longer be in the middle of the class, but I will be right there at the top with everyone else. So we see that in heaven there will be perfect knowledge. I want you to notice in the fifth place, the uh, uh, perfection of service in heaven. Now look what John says in verse three. He said, no longer will there be anything accursed, but, throne, but the throne of God and of the lamb will be in it and his servants will worship. Now that word worship there actually means serve. So what it literally says there is, and his servants will serve him. And then in verse five, it says, and night will be no more. They will need no light or lamp or sun for the Lord God will be their light and they will reign forever and ever. You know, since God will continue forever as heaven's sovereign ruler, his servants 
will serve him forever. John writes back in chapter 7 of Revelation, in verse 15, he wrote this. He says, therefore they, and he's referring to those standing around the throne in white robes. He says, therefore they, those in the white robes, are before the throne of God and they serve him night, day and night in his temple. See, we will spend all of eternity carrying out the infinite variety of tasks that God assigns to us. Friend, that's you and me. We were saved, listen to me carefully, we were saved to serve God. Now, I want you to think about that for just a moment. We were saved to serve God. But we weren't saved to wait to serve God when we get to heaven. We were saved to serve God here with the gifts, the spiritual gifts that God gives us, the talents, the abilities. We were saved to serve God here. Our service here is preparing us for our service in heaven. <clears throat> And we will continue to serve God for all eternity. So don't worry about being bored when you get to heaven. We are going to be uh, busy. We're going to be active in serving the Lord. In heaven, we are going to be eternally serving God as his bondservants managing his universe. We are going to be busy working. You know, many people like to believe that work is a result of the curse. But I would remind you that Adam had already been assigned work in the Garden of Eden before he fell into sin. That means that God glorifying, personally fulfilling work is part of God's original plan for us. God put us here on this earth to serve him, to worship him, and that will not stop when we die. We will continue to serve and to worship God for all eternity. It was only after Adam sinned that his work became a burden, that his work became hard. Like everything else marred by sin, work needs to be redeemed to its original purpose. Friend, I will tell you something. Not just, I'm not talking about just have physical labor or work out there in the secular world is hard. It's burdensome at times. It's stressful. It's frustrating. Even the work for the Lord done in his church is not perfect. It is tiring. We get weary. We get stressed out. We get frustrated. We, we get afraid sometimes, but that will all change when we get to heaven. The work and the service we do for God in heaven will be perfect. A lot of people don't like to go to work every day because they don't like their jobs. They simply are do, working a job that they do not like or enjoy. They are bored with what they are doing. So therefore, they are unfulfilled or the job uh, just in their mind just doesn't pay enough. But heaven doesn't have any of these problems. You will never get tired of your work in heaven. You will never struggle. It will never become a burden. You will never fail at your work. Instead, you will love the work that God the Father assigns to you in heaven. And it will be totally fulfilling and you will be blessed by that work. Serving God as his priest and administrators will be the most rewarding thing we have ever done. In heaven, there is going to be no idling away of time. In other words, we're not just going to simply wake up every day uh, and just uh, stroll the streets of gold or float around on clouds playing harps. That's not what we're going to be doing in heaven. 
We will serve God through worship and work, through service, which we, and service of which we will never grow tired or bored or dissatisfied. For me, I want to say to you, this will be heaven. Friend, I love serving the Lord. Yes, serving the Lord can have its bumps. There are some bruises that you uh, feel along the way. Uh, there's, there's days when you uh, want to just throw in the towel. There are days when it's harder than other days. Uh, there is a great deal of stress and frustration. But in heaven, it will be different. And there is nothing else that I would rather do than serve my Lord. Our responsibility in heaven will increase proportionately to what we have done here on earth. Do you remember Jesus' parable in Luke 19? Jesus suggests that his servants who were faithful on earth will be put in charge of cities in heaven. Now, that indicates that there will be levels of administrative responsibilities in the heavenly uh, realm, in heaven, where we are going when we die. <clears throat> Jesus said, well done, good servant. Because you've been faithful in a very little, you shall have authority over 10 cities. Now think about what that means. Those who are faithful in a few minor things will be put in charge of multiple things in heaven. At the judgment seat of Christ, we will bring all that we are and all that we've done for the Lord before him as he sits on his throne. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. For in your sins will not condemn you in heaven. Psalm 103 verses 10 through 12 promises us this. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. If you have placed your trust in Jesus Christ to take away your sins based on the sacrifice that he made on Calvary's cross and your faith and trust in him, then you have nothing to fear when you enter into heaven. Jesus did away with all of your sins. There will be no judgment for you in heaven uh, based on your sins. You will not be punished for your sins. Your sins have been erased. They have been washed away. Sin no longer has power to wound or to inflict remorse or regret. The judgment seat of Christ is different. It's not like a trial to determine whether you're guilty or innocent. The judgment seat of Christ is more like a judging stand to determine your capacity to serve God. In other words, we will bring to the judgment seat of Christ all that we are and all that we've done. One look from the Lord will consume our worthless service here on earth, but it will illuminate God-honoring service, the things that we did to honor God while we were here. Now, it is this for which we will be commended. The work that we've done here that will uh, be commended when we stand before Christ on that day at, in front of his judgment seat. And I believe with all my heart that when we stand there before the judgment seat of Christ, we will drop to our knees and we will with the words of our master ringing in our hearts, we will bow 
in humble adoration. The scripture tells us in Matthew chapter 25, his master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. For to everyone who has will more be given and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. Friend, I'm dying to hear those words from my Lord. Literally, I want to put to death every selfish motive and prideful pretense so that when the Lord's eyes scan my earthly service done for him, what I have built upon my prayer is that it will stand the test. I want to be careful how I build. I want everything I do here to be an eternal investment, a way of building something that is bright and beautiful there. That's how much things down here count. I want to say that again. That's how much things down here count. Everything that we do for the Lord is being measured. It's being evaluated. And one day we will be compensated and rewarded with service in heaven based upon our work and our service here for the Lord. And let me just say, no one will be left out. Each one will receive his or her reward. Each of us or have a capacity to serve the Lord in heaven. We will have something to do, some more than others. But what you are given to do in heaven will in large part have everything to do with what you do here in heaven, on earth. And so I pray that you will understand how important it is that the work you do here is important because our work here is determining what our work and service in heaven will be like. Now I want you to note, Jesus doesn't say, because you have been successful in a very small matter. No, he says, because you have been faithful. Johnny Erickson Tata says, when it comes to the judgment seat, God won't pull out the return on investment charts and do a cost effectiveness analysis on your earthly service. She said, every Christian is on the same playing field. Success isn't the key. Faithfulness is. Being bigger and better is not the point. It's being obedient. So the more trustworthy you've been, the greater your service in eternity. We not only get to praise God forever, but we get to reign with him forever. John writes in chapter 3 of Revelation, in verse 21, The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne, as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. Can you believe that? We will sit with Christ on his throne and reign with him. We will be given a sphere of authority and oversight of God's eternal kingdom. So heaven will be a place of perfect service. When, you know, we get to heaven, I don't know about you, but I'm just thinking what that is going to be like from this point as i look towards the future and think about heaven i want to think about what the scripture tells me heaven is going to be like we've looked at the fact that heaven is going to be a place of perfect beauty it's going to be a place of perfect worship it's going to be a place of perfect life. Everything about us will be perfect. We will have perfect knowledge and we will be engaged in perfect service. One of the greatest evangelists who ever lived was Dwight L. Moody. <clears throat> Moody was a man with an eternal perspective. 
Mooney did not fear what lay beyond death's door. He was a man who was excited about his heavenly destiny. And he looked forward to living in the new Jerusalem in the very presence of God. One Sunday in August of 1899, Moody exclaimed to a New York City crowd, he said, someday you will read in the papers that Dwight Moody is dead. Don't you believe a word of it? At that moment, I shall be more alive than I am now. I, am born of the fle- I was born of the flesh in 1837. I was born of the Spirit in 1855. That which is born of the flesh may die. That which is born of the Spirit shall live forever. Four months later, exhausted from years of preaching and laboring for the Lord, D.L. Moody lay dying. Early in the morning of December the 22nd, Moody's son, Will, was startled by his father's voice from across the room as he lay in his bed. Moody said, earth recedes, heaven opens before me. Will hurried over to his father's bedside. He said, this is no dream, Will. And then he said, it is beautiful. If this is death, it is sweet. God is calling me and I must go. Don't call me back. A few hours later, D.L. Moody revived to find his wife and family gathered around him. He said to his wife, I went to the gate of heaven. Why, it is so wonderful. And I saw the children, Irene and Dwight, who had died in childhood. Moody said to his wife, I saw our children who had died. Within hours, the man who had stirred two nations for Christ took few final breaths and then entered the gate of heaven. Friend D.L. Moody's entrance into heaven is a testimony to the fact that Jesus has taken the sting out of death for the Christian. The anticipation of entering heaven one day, that place of infinite perfections and glory is joyful for those of us who hold Christ dear to our hearts. So here's what I want to say to you, my Christian friend. Fear not that you will die one day as we all shall. Your Savior has you in his hands in this life and with open arms he awaits you in heaven where everything will be perfect from the moment we enter into heaven for all of eternity everything about that wonderful place will be perfect and all God's people said amen let's pray father we thank you today For this look into heaven from the Apostle John, from the book of Revelation, God, we thank you that we have so much to look forward to as we depart this life and enter into that place where you have prepared for us. God, I pray that these words of Scripture will be encouraging to all of your saints. And Lord, I pray that we will use these words to challenge others who may not know Jesus to challenge them of what a bright and glorious future in eternity awaits those who know Jesus as Savior and Lord. We love you, Lord, and we praise you. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, friend, for listening this evening. I hope you've been blessed by the message. And if uh, you're able, I look forward to seeing you this coming Sunday. God bless.